There's only two defining factors of people that have given their life, and that's the American soldier and Jesus Christ. The American soldier died for your freedom. Jesus Christ died for your soul. It's called More Than a Name on the Wall. I saw her from a distance as she walked up to the wall. In her hand she held the flower as her tears began to fall. She took
I just think it's so great that we have this opportunity to fellowship and to worship our Lord. I want to take just a minute now. If you looked at your handout, you've noticed that the program is titled, Do You Remember? We'll be uh, looking at uh, some scripture from Isaiah 53. And just to kind of summarize this message a little bit, like Sue mentioned earlier when she was here, Memorial Day is generally celebrated to recognize the sacrifices made by our military personnel, men and women both. Hallelujah, thank you, men and women that are out there serving. And do you know, Jesus made a similar sacrifice. Let us pray. Father God, we're gathered here today to remember and to honor the lives that have touched ours. We are opening this memorial service with heavy hearts, but also with gratitude for the precious memories that we hold. May your comforting presence surround us as we celebrate the lives of those that we've lost. We ask, Father, please comfort the hearts burden with sorrow and wrap us in the warmth of your love. May this memorial service bring healing. May the memories we cherish be a source of strength. Amen. It's 3 a.m. on a cold winter day. Patchy snow covers the landscape, and outside there's a land outside the... Uh, Barracks and all the big loudspeakers are blaring overhead. They're telling everybody, it's time to go to your places. Surrounded by sandbags, concrete barriers, and roughly 10,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen. Bagram Air Force Base has flipped the switch. And has turned from a deployed city in sleep to a sea of green and tan military waiting. Further instructions. They're waiting for what's going to be coming out of the loudspeaker next. Some have just woken up from their nights of sleep. Others have concluded their duties to the night and they're off to do whatever they're choosing to do. But all are focused on the events that are about to unfold. So down this three mile road of the Afghanistan base, now imagine that. Standing shoulder to shoulder, men and women there in the military, awaiting to pay their respects to a fallen comrade. And soon the lights of the emergency vehicles can be seen slowly making their way up the boulevard there. And there's escorts. They're, they're leading a flatbed trailer <coughs> to an awaiting C-17 cargo plane on its way back to the United States. And on the trailer are three caskets that are draped in United States flags. And as that trailer approaches, as you might imagine, the lines of servicemen lining those streets each pay their respects by saluting sharply the men and women who paid the ultimate price. Once that trailer reaches the plane, the formation is dismissed. Thousands of servicemen and women in the middle of the war zone paying homage and respect the best way they know how. And you know, what I've just described is just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, because similar ceremonies are performed out in other parts of the world on a way too regular basis. And it's all for us to show the love to show the respect for the sacrifices, for the dedicated duties our military service men and women show on a daily basis. Brothers and sisters, Memorial Day is about remembering these fallen heroes and honoring their sacrifices on our behalf. Every conflict that we've ever been in, it don't matter, has had its share of casualties of both sons and daughters, often due to unusual bravery that they've shown in the midst of combat. Every once in a while, during these conflicts, something happened. 
The soldier does something that is so extraordinary, it's so out of the way, that Congress acknowledges that act. And they award that person the Medal of Honor. You know, it's presented to someone who has distinguished himself or herself by gallantry at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. And you know, that deed that's performed must have been one of self-sacrifice so conspicuous as to clearly distinguish the individual above his comrades and must have involved loss of life or risk of life. More often than not, these individual sacrifices are done for the greater good of others. One such individual was a guy named Douglas Albert Monroe. The Medal of Honor was presented to Petty Officer Monroe as a result of his actions on September 27th in 1942. Monroe was in charge of a group of 24 Higgins boats. Anybody familiar with the Higgins boat? You know, it's kind of like the landing craft that pulls up to the up onto the beach and the, and the door flops down and all. The, he was in charge of 24 Higgins boats. And it's engaged in the evacuation of Marines that were trapped over there by enemy Japanese forces at Point Cruz Guadalcanal. Ooh. So after making some preliminary plans for the evacuation of nearly 500 beleaguered Marines, Monroe was under, under constant strafing by enemy fire and machine guns, but at great risk to his life. He daringly led five of those craft right towards the shore. And as he closed on the beach, he signaled the others to land in order to draw the enemy's fire to him and protect those boats that were being loaded up, he violently placed his craft right there with his two small guns as a shield between the beachhead and the Japanese. And when that perilous task of evacuation was nearly completed, Monroe was instantly killed. Killed by enemy fire. And his crew, two of whom had also been wounded, carried on until that last boat had loaded and cleared the beach. You know, by his outstanding leadership, his gallantry, his planning, his dauntless devotion to duty, he and his comrades undoubtedly saved the lives of many others who would have perished. He gallantly gave his life for this country. There's an example for you. And you know, another such example Sacrifice made by a guy by the name of Pat Tillman. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah. Pat Tillman, you know, he was a professional football player. I believe it was the Cardinals right here. He'd had a very distinguished career, I believe, over at ASU. You probably all know the story about him. He joined the U.S. Army, though. He felt the call to duty. And he eventually joined up with the Special Forces. And he found his way into battle over into the Afghanistan countryside. And Pat also paid the ultimate price. There are so many, many stories. Maybe each one of you out there has got one or more stories similar to these. But the picture is clear. Many men and women put their lives in extreme danger for their comrades in arms. And in some cases, they give their lives so that others may. How many times have you heard, brothers and sisters, the stories about maybe one of our heroes that throws himself on a, on a, a uh, grenade. grenade, okay, some kind of enemy fire or grenade, and he takes the brunt of that explosion so that his brothers and sisters might live, might live to fight on. Mm. I have no doubt that every time that happens, in the weeks following something like that, those recipients of such unselfishness are inspired to fight even harder for their wounded or fallen comrades. Perhaps with more zeal than ever before, 
And you know this in a small Middle Eastern country some nearly 2,000 years ago, that's exactly what happened. A closer look at this hero reveals that there's a lot of similarities to the heroes I just described, but there's also some significant differences. His name was Jesus, son of Joseph the carpenter, born in Nazareth. And we don't know a whole lot about him as just a small child. I know we all know the Christmas story. Yeah, we know a little bit about that. And most of us, I hope all of us have read the story about how he remained in the temple when his parents went and they had to return to the temple to gather him up because he was back there doing his ministry. His parents came to find him. But then, you know, after that, there seems to be a significant jump in time ahead. We don't know much about his teen or his early years following that. But in his adult life and his ministry, when we kind of jump ahead a little bit, we know that he's out there among his people doing his ministry. Not only the Jews, but Gentiles as well. Really, who might have expected such heroic actions from this man? The prophet Isaiah tells us, hey, he don't look fit enough physically to be a hero for us. There's nothing here that would hint at the possibility that he could be our hero. Not like we picture our heroes. But like so many heroes of our present day, he too gave of himself. And to begin with, Jesus put himself right there in harm's way. He endured the pain and the suffering for the benefit of others. In a reading in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, this was foretold in advance. If you want to read along with me, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. My scripture reads, yes, it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And he did it all willingly. If we continue right on over to verse 7, it reads, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Boy, there's a message right there. We can stop. Did everybody hear what I just read? I'd be pleased to share it again. Look at what he suffered for you and me, dear brothers and sisters. And you know Matthew. Matthew records in the Gospels not once, but twice how Jesus responded to that pain and that suffering that he was asked to endure. And you know the response that Jesus said. You all know these words and it's such as this. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. You ever read that in the Bible? That tells you what's going on a little bit. Just as in the case of Petty Officer Monroe, Jesus willingly endured the pain and the suffering on behalf of his people to the point of death. Paul wrote in his letter to Philippians, he said, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Can you even stop and imagine that for just a minute? How many of us would willingly go forth to be nailed to the cross with those old rusty nails into our hands and to our feet for some other. And in this case, each one of us. Romans 5 reads, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Oh, I, I love this verse. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
He took our sin. He carried that sin. Can you imagine what a load when you look at just a small room and multiply it by millions and millions of times over the amount of sin that he took on? Oh. Dear brothers and sisters, I think we can easily see how that comparison falls short. Those men and women of the military, they put their lives in danger for their fellow comrades against other human beings. But the battle that Christ waged was so much more powerful and devastating. The ultimate victory was not simply like being out there to take some hilltop over there. His victory was not over there that we secure this body of water. The victory was not even in one country taking possession of another country. But one which secured our very souls, folks, the victory over the power of the devil, the sin in their lives, and ultimately the victory over death. Boy, that ought to be a hallelujah, amen, time and again. Amen. Right. Yeah. You see, in that victory that was made by Jesus Christ, like Douglas Monroe, it inspired many of those who witnessed it or heard about it. And his first letter, Peter wrote of Jesus. And he said, he encouraged his readers with the lessons he learned from his commanding officer. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, and part of 16, it just reads, Instead, you must worship. Christ is Lord of your life, and if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, I think I just said here some few minutes ago, be proud of your association with the Lord. Be proud that he's the captain of your ship. Never be ashamed to go out there. Share the good news. Pick up some of those pocket gospels back there and share them. And then you know later on in his letter, Paul's words of caution and encouragement speak to us. In verse 8 he says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. And that tells you, brothers and sisters, you are not alone. Each of us has our cross to bear. I've, I've shared this story with a few of you, but... I, I want to share it once again. It talks about this man that felt that he had such a heavy cross to bear that he approached the Lord and he said, I can't do it anymore. you got to get this off my back. And the Lord said, okay, just take it off. And he took him in the room and he said, put it against the wall over there. And he went back out into the first room and they were talking a little further. The Lord said, well, it's time for you to select what kind of a cross that you can bear. So they went back into the room and the man looked around and over a wall over here he saw, he saw a little bitty cross, you know, right there. Big crosses all around him, but he saw a little bitty cross. And he said, Lord, I'm gonna take that one right there. And the Lord said, that's the one you brought in. Oh. <laughs> mm. Just stop and think. Every time we cry because we don't have use of an arm, praise God we've got an arm. Every time your legs kind of give out, you look at it and you say, boy, I'm sure suffering because of it. Look down, you got legs. I have the opportunity, I have the privilege to deal a lot with the veterans. Pretty active with the Patriot Guard riders doing a lot of funerals and all. But I've been involved in some good things too where we've done a house dedication. For example, where local merchants get together and they also get a grant from the government to build a house. The last one I attended was for 
The young man lost both his legs in Afghanistan, and the walls were built a little bit wider for him to be able to get down the hall efficiently. And that's such just a blessing. And I didn't mean to deviate. But you know the clearest, the, probably the most dynamic example of the life of Christ and his death and his resurrection inspired his people to the fact that what? We are here today to say hymns, to say hymns of joy and hope and inspiration and love to our Savior. We're here to the word, here to her, hear the word of God. Offer up our prayers of praise and petition and encourage one another in faith. You know, in spite of all those issues that have created problems, the fact does remain that America still has the most well-equipped, the very, very best trained military in the history of the world. And that is combined with the technology that we have to uh, make it all work, makes it seem a little bit invincible, I think, until another attack comes on our home. We need to be honest with ourselves, folks. We need to admit that this is a world of terrorist attacks and individuals who do not hesitate one moment to give up their lives for what they believe or the, their cause. Then we will never be totally protected and invulnerable is the word I'm looking for. You know, in today's reading, Jesus explains from Matthew, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Have you all read that scripture? These events are happening as we speak today. And more like they're, they're probably going to continue to happen more and more and more into the future. But the psalmist seems to tell us, to help us answer that message of gloom and doom in verse 34, 4, says, I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. That says a whole lot. Paul says this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. But you see, Christians fight kind of a different kind of world war beyond that physical act of combat. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. You see, the weapons that we fight with are not those same weapons out there that our folks, our military personnel have. On the contrary, our weapons have a divine power to demolish strongholds. You see, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul paints out an even more specific and a graphic picture. He describes the armor of God such as the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness is what you're carrying. Our feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. We carry the shield of faith. We have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. What could be better than that? And so, folks, that armor is combined with a life of steady and regular, let's say constant and meaningful prayer will indeed protect you and me from the temptations that come our way. And it will ultimately preserve us so when the day comes, we can join our Heavenly Father. Eternal peace, eternal joy in heaven. Just briefly back to our war story. All of a sudden, a man with a watch jumped out of a foxhole. He crawled over to his wounded buddy, you see over there. And he grabbed him by the nape of the collar and he began to drag him over to his foxhole to make him safe. And all the time, there's sniper fire just whizzing all around him. But he made it back without any further or additional injury. And after that sniper fire had died down, the man who saved his buddy was asked why he waited so long to crawl over there after his wounded friend. And a man responded this way. Let's see if I get this right. He said, my mom said that every day at the exact same time she would be praying for me. And according to my watch, 
I let the foxhole exactly when she started praying. You know, folks, we may not always receive answers to prayer in such a dramatic fashion. And sometimes even though our prayers might involve physical protection, many of our prayers involve the sparing of life. A lot of times they seem to go unanswered. Now I want to talk about prayer for just a minute. I think we got just a minute. I'll talk fast. It's, it's very important that your life be centered around prayer. It's so important. And the Lord says, prayer is just simply you talking to me. There's nothing grand about it. There's nothing spectacular about it. Just talking and listening to God in a conversational tone, if you will. And it's something. If you're not doing it, you should do it every day. And if you're doing it every day, you should do it twice a day. And if you should do it twice a day, make it four times a day. There is no limit. I think there are days that I talk to the Lord dozens of times. Why do we pray? There's a number of reasons why we pray. It reinforces what God is, what He's put in our lives, and the depths of our relationship with Him. It reveals our heart's strength for Him and endurance, and it moves our focus to self-reliance. Keeps your mind and your heart trusting in the sovereignty of God. Let me ask you this. Whose idea is prayer? I think we all know the answer. Prayer is God's idea. He's the one that came up with that conception. And He promises that He hears our prayers. And He'll answer our prayers. But He answers our prayers according to His will for our life and for His greater glory. So folks, it appears we have God's promise that the ultimate victory in this world, the one which guarantees us an eternity with Him, is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will seek salvation. The need for our military force will never go away. You know, we need to have that protectorate from all those forces around the globe that seek to destroy us for what we stand for, for who we are, and yet we're guaranteed the rights and the privileges that we express today thanks to our servicemen and women. It's through those soldiers and those sailors and Marines that we have the luxury, and it's truly a luxury of unprecedented freedom on earth. But only Christ can grant the freedom from sin that his sacrifice has granted us. That word freedom. Nobody got in your way today to keep you from coming to church. Nobody said you need to worship this way or that way. We have such an amazing freedom. I think I got that done in a fairly timely manner. I probably should have got one little short story I want to read for you and then I'll get you out of here. The sound of fragrance of familiar face steps my mind back to the past like the tip of a leather whip breaking the sound barrier, sending me back in time when fire and rain ruled my world. Now listen to the story. I was young. I was young then, although not as innocent, so it seems. But there are these ancient times, which I played back then that I associate with places and experiences that I would rather forget. They still haunt my mind like the sound of helicopters, Chomping to damp air while coming into a hot LZ. Repeating over and over like a bad set of unwanted beats and lyrics that keep thundering inside my head. Like a hard rain on a tin roof with its mind numbing drumming. I'm amazed how the sweet smell of summer rain itself can be a sickening reminder of time spent in a muddy hole. Somewhere in the jungle that existed so long ago. Then I see a young face, which reminds me of someone I, I once knew in hell, 
who was taken in the prime of his youth. And through old eyes, I wonder how this could be. The body grows old, but the mind stays young, and some memories are meant to remain eternal. There's no switch to turn off the madness, and deja vu sends the senses reeling into overdrive. All the while, I wonder where and when the brakes will kick in, and when these sights and sounds and fragrances will come to a screeching halt. I then remember that I was young once, and now I am old, and still not so innocent, so it seems. You know, a little bit of that story kind of reeks of PTSD to me. Everybody familiar with that terminology? post-traumatic stress disorder. How so many of our military personnel have suffered from that. That's really a pretty poignant story. But I thought maybe it's kind of appropriate to help you find a take home today. I want you to find something that we've covered today to take home with you to help you walk with the Lord. And I also need to know it. I took part of this sermon from an unknown author that I found on the internet that he intended for a Veterans Day message. So Jan's going to come up and play, play the song of invitation as we take a moment of, moment of reflection, consider what we've heard today, who we are, what we stand for, and to consider those many blessings that we so enjoy, the freedoms. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, if you're here this morning, you have a yearning. Maybe you have a feeling inside that something isn't quite right. Maybe you don't have that relationship with God. Maybe you had a relationship that you felt fell by the way a little bit. difference in the world around you. Amen.